Good morning, everybody. Let's get our lights set up. Good morning. Welcome to Tea Time with Jesus. Can y'all hear me? Is this clear enough? I don't know. I'm trying to get my stuff squared away. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Tea Time with Jesus. I'm so excited to have you joining. I'm going to wait a couple of minutes. Um, while we're waiting for folks to tune in, and I'm actually going to sip my tea while we're doing that. Get your tea ready if you don't have it ready, or whatever beverage makes your soul sparkle at 7.48 in the morning. It's Central Standard Time. Good morning. Let me know if someone just joined. Let me know who you are so I can say hello to you. We are going to get started. Um, for those who are new, welcome to Tea Time with Jesus. My name is Leslie Williams, and good morning, Elizabeth. How are you? Good morning. My name is Leslie Williams, and I am so excited to be with you this morning. Um, for those of you that are new to Tea Time with Jesus, it is a virtual quiet time experience with some of the best people in the world. We have people that tune in and watch from all over to carve out time on their Saturday morning to spend time with Jesus. And it is glorious. It is prioritizing Jesus, not just in our words, not just through Sunday morning church attendance, but making sure that Jesus is a priority seven days a week. So I like to encourage you, as I like to encourage myself, is that this is not just a once a week thing. This is just to help fuel you to get in the habit of carving out time with Jesus. I know it's hard. You know, in this season, my time with Jesus has been in the afternoons or late mornings. Um, but yesterday morning, the Lord was like, uh-uh, uh -uh, you have to just kind of put me first. For me, it works when I wake up and I just automatically just go into my quiet time. For me, it's at the tone of my heart that Jesus um, is the priority and everything else kind of falls underneath it. Um, and I know it's hard, right? Because I've been like, oh my gosh, I have this to do, it's quiet, so I can do this while everyone is asleep, and I can think through this, and God is like, no, no, no. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so I too am having to get back in the habit of making sure that Jesus is at the top of my day and just kind of um, getting into that mode of self-discipline. Um, again, it was so interesting. And I was talking to the Lord like last week, or yeah, I think it was last week. And I was talking to him about self-discipline. And I was like, you know, Lord, what is, why do we need self-discipline? Why? I just wanted to hear his response. Why do we need self-discipline? Like, talk to my heart. And I don't have what he said in front of me, but I did write it down. And he basically just said, self-discipline is a tool. And good morning, Miss Williams. Self-discipline is a, is, is a gift. It, is, it protects us. It keeps us sober-minded and prevents us from getting deceived. Because when you're, when you're like disciplined, and you're just doing what you know you need to do, there's really no room for the enemy to come in. Um, and so it's just that when we're guided by our emotions and not, you know, rooted in those things that we know that the Lord is asking us to do, the enemy has an opportunity to come in and wreck havoc. So that is where I am with my tea time with Jesus. Um, and I'm not sure where you are, um, but if you've fallen off, we get back on making Jesus a priority in your day. Um, if you're just starting, yay, that's awesome. Um, and so we're all just kind of moving forward. So for those that are just joining, my name is Leslie Williams and welcome to Tea Time with Jesus. Um, I'm so excited about today and I always forget to tell people to share, to share and like the videos. Um, I was so blessed by the video last week on truth and I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to share that, but if you did, um, wonderful. And if you didn't, please do. Um, this video is going to be pretty, pretty awesome today. I'm so excited because I learned so much. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, for those that are new to Tea Time with Jesus, we always like to say, get your tools. Um, 
First of all, get your tea. I don't know what beverage makes your soul sparkle this morning, but whatever it is, I'm a tea drinker. I'm not really big on coffee, but if it's coffee, if it's water, if you're drinking smoothies, you know, whatever it is, get that ready. Um, and then get your Bible because we'll be looking at scripture. It doesn't have to be a hard copy. I am very old school and I like my hard copy Bible, but you can look it up on your iPhone, your Android device, your computer, whatever works. Um, get your journal or something to write with. I am a journaler. Um, so if the Lord is going to speak to you, which is my prayer every time that you may hear my words, but it's like, Lord, you do what you do best. You just customize this message into the hearts of every single person that's listening. And um, yeah. And so write down what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And then lastly, get somewhere really comfortable and quiet that is maybe distraction free. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's your car, if you're still in your bed, if you're, you know, at the kitchen table, if you're out walking. I'm not sure where that place is, but just get somewhere where you can just focus in on you and the Lord. And um, yeah, and so we're going to go from there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pray and then we'll open it up. Father, in Jesus name, Lord, we just thank you, God, for this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as believers, Lord, and walk in your truth. Truth is, um, it's something, Lord, that's been ringing in my heart for a while. Father, I just feel like it's just ringing, um, it's just ringing in the spirit realm, just truth, truth, truth. And so, Lord, I thank you that it is not your will for your children to be deceived. But God, we, we know that the word says that many perish because of lack of knowledge. And God, I thank you that that will not be us. I thank you, Lord God, that we are walking your truth, that the Holy Spirit is continuously revealing wisdom and truth concerning the things um, in our lives and in the world, Lord. And I thank you, Father God, um, that you are um, molding our hearts to be advocates of truth. That, Father God, we won't reject the truth as the Bible talks about that some will. Father, but that we will be lovers of the truth. We will embrace your truth. Father God, that it will be your truth um, and not our truth or the world system's truth, Father. So we thank you, God, for doing something new and amazing in our hearts this morning. We thank you, Lord God. Um, we just thank you, Jesus, for, for, um, for comforting the families Father God, of those sweet babies um, in Uvalde, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that your word says that you draw near to the brokenhearted God. And Father God, um, the pain that they're experiencing is unimag unimaginable. Um, but God, we know that you know exactly how that feels, Lord. So Father, however, um, you have to carry them through this, literally, Lord. Um, whatever needs to be um, done, Lord, to make um, to make things safer for our children, Lord. However, you need to awaken us in our hearts as parents, um, or as people who, um, as people who oversee or our mentor children in any way, God, whatever wisdom you need to give us, Lord God. Father, we thank you that our hearts are leaned in towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Can y'all hear an echo? Let me know because I felt like um, I was hearing some feedback. I don't know if y'all can hear something. I think you're on as well, LaVar. If you can hear some feedback or something, y'all let me know if, if something is off in regards to the sound. Okay. All right. Um, so this morning is a bit of an ouch. It's not an ouch. It's just something that's not really talked about very often, but I felt like it needed to be said. Um, I keep hearing feedback. Do I hear feedback? Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. I just felt like it's needed to be the Lord had it on my heart. Um, he spoke this to my heart 
last Saturday and brought it up again last night. So I felt like it just needed to be discussed. So to this morning, we are going to talk about sexual immorality. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, but we're going to set, set the topic up with this scripture. Uh, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I think we're going to start at verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 1. Okay, it says this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous, which means times of stress, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, lovers of themselves, meaning all about them, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, unforgiving that that word translates to irreconcilable or hostile to, to each other, slanderers. You know, a slanderer is one who attacks the reputation of another. So they'll be slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, that means prideful, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Verse six, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible, which means easily persuaded to believe something. Gullible women loaded down with sin. Loaded down with sin. Led away by various lust, always learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, I'm going to read verse six again. For this sort of those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, always led away by various lusts, always learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, if I can be honest, this picture to me, paints um, the times that we're living in. The adjectives that are used to describe the hearts and the character of people in verses two through five clearly describes a portion of our world's population today. Would you agree? Let's think about it. You know, many of the celebrities that we see on television, we could probably describe them as lovers of themselves, self-absorbed, lovers of money, proud, unholy, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. But believe me when I'm saying that these same traits in verses two, three, five are not limited to celebrities. It can be found in folks who aren't even celebrities. I believe that God showed me that social media has played a big role in cultivating these characteristics in people because everyone wants to talk about themselves and how great they are. And they want to present their life, you know, in a way that it's a certain, a certain image. They want to produce a life that presents a certain image and they want you to like their photos and they want you to see, you know, the car that they bought and when they're on vacation, if we could be just flat out honest, it's not because we want to share this good news with a thousand of our social media friends. That's not every reason. That's not for everyone, although it's, some, it's for some. It's because we're wanting to present a certain image. And so when you're fueled by that desire to present a certain image, when you're fueled by the likes that you get on Instagram or on Facebook, if you're fueled by those emojis of the hearts or the wow, or the, if you're fueled by that, then these characteristics can start to develop. You will then 
become a lover of yourself. You will then become a lover of money. You can then become um, proud. You can then become all of these things. If you get caught up, you can become those things. You know, it's become a whole thing. And let's be honest. Don't think that these traits are limited to people who are just outside the church. There are people and there will be people who are inside the church who have fallen prey to these same character traits. Let's look at verse five. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. It didn't say having godliness. It says a form of it. Think about this statement. What does it mean? It means there will be people who identify as Christian with their mouth, but they will deny the power of God to work in their lives. They will deny surrendering to Christ and living a transformed life and will have a life with the characteristics that we just listed above. They will be sitting in church. They may even be speaking in church, but they have made it all about them. They have made it about their image. They have made it about their, uh, their anniversary. They've made it about their parking spot. They've made it about um, their followers, their likes, their book deals. They've made it about their podcast. They've made it about um, the things that people can do for them to fuel them. They have not made it about the Lord anymore. You know, I think that the statement having a form of godliness but denying its power even applies to people who um, are considered influencers in our world who are promoting these new age and occult type practices. People that are talking about things such as the universe and the trees and um, all of the other type of occult type things claiming that it's a form of godliness but denying the actual power, not having the power of the Holy Spirit, not having the power that comes from accepting Jesus Christ, believing it's a form of godliness, but being confused, being deceived, when in reality it's not. The scripture says, as for these people turn away, it, that means run real fast, y'all. Shut your ears to them. Don't be deceived. You know, what I think is so interesting is that the scripture says, as for these people, turn away. You know, so many believers think that they don't have the ability to be deceived. I think not. I think thinking that you are not susceptible to deception is deception within itself. Because the Bible says, as for these people, turn away, meaning don't entertain them. I think because you too could fall prey if you hang around folks like that too long. So I just want us, I think that that's a lie. I just want us to understand that the enemy has tried to deceive us by thinking that we can't be deceived. And so therefore we don't have guards and keep ourselves open to listening and hearing all sorts of things, because for some reason, we have come to believe that we are invincible to deception. And yes, we are strong in many areas. And yes, we, we know right from wrong and will not fall. Pray to that as easily. But to think that you don't have to put up guards as the Holy Spirit leads, I think, is deception. So I just want to say, if the Holy Spirit is leading you, there are some areas that you may be weak in and the Lord is like, no, you can't watch that. Or no, you can't listen to that. Or no, you can't really hang around this person. Or you can't talk to this person right now. If the Lord is leading you to do that, friend, don't reason it and say, oh, I can do it. Oh, I'm fine. I know I'm, I'm fine. I know right from wrong. Because the Lord knows you in and out. And so I just want to tell you to surrender to that and not surrender to the pride. Surrender to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so our main verse is this, verse six. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women. Okay, let's talk about this. So let's let's paint the picture. So the Bible describes that in the last day, there will be 
folks with these characteristics. Specifically, it says men. So we're going to go with it. There'll be men with these characteristics. And so these men with those characteristics in verses two through five, right? Pride, proud and lovers of themselves and just all of that will be able to creep into households. The word creep means to move slowly or carefully to avoid being noticed. Personally, I think if you're creeping, you know that your intentions are not good. You wouldn't be creeping if you were being 100% upfront. It says, for of this sort of those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women. Gullible women. Women who are easily persuaded to believe anything. Gullible women. You know, I'm going to jump ahead of myself just a little bit if I can find it in my notes. But I was reading one commentary. And um, I'll get to it, but let me just kind of, uh, gosh, I can't remember where it is. But he was basically saying that, that, oh uh, gosh, let me just stick with the notes because I was going to jump ahead of myself. Um, that there were women, oh, that women are, because women are easily um, manipulated in their emotions. And oftentimes are easily led by emotions that um, this scripture was for talking about a group of, well, in the day that scripture was written, that there were a group of um, hypocritical professors who claimed to know Christ, but essentially twisted the scripture and the doctrine to fit their sin. And so these men, these hypocritical professors, who claimed to know Christ, but twisted the doctrine to fit their sin, would prey on women, specifically, specifically gullible women, as the scripture says, who were loaded down with sin. They would prey on those women because they could come to the women and tell them anything and the women would believe them and they would basically use these women to fuel whatever doctrine that they were trying to promote. And so it says again, that these types of folks would creep into households and make captives of gullible women. Women loaded down with sin. Loaded down with sin. I mean, are y'all just picturing this? These women who are so naive, who are believing anything, the latest doctrine, the latest celebrity thing, the latest fad, the latest march the latest protest they believe anything because they are so um not rooted they're so not sure of who they are in christ and then them being loaded down with sin does not help because meaning that there's a couple of things going on if you're loaded down with sin these women are deceived because there is perpetual sin going on in their life like if you're loaded down that meaning you were under the weight of it so that tends to me that there is perpetual sin going on. And if you're perpetually sinning, meaning that there is something that you're deceived about. Like if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, it says that they're gullible. They easily believe anything, meaning there's some there's some ignorance going on. There's some lack of wisdom going on. There are some sin, some sin that they're a slave to. Um. I think also, too, that these sweet women don't know how much God loves them, that they don't understand they don't have to be under the weight of that sin. There are women who love Jesus, who know Jesus, but they don't understand how much God loves them. And when you understand how much God loves you, it is a whole game changer. People can't come at you anyway with anything, with any doctrine, because you know the heart of the one who you serve. You know God's heart. You know God's heart. It is a difference to go just go to church and um, to live off of the, I just had to say this for somebody, 
um, to live off of the the coattail of like, oh, my mom did this and my grandfather did this and they went to church. And there's a difference to be like familiar with Jesus. And there's a difference when you know the heart of Jesus, the heart of the father. And these women did not know the heart of Jesus because if they did, they would understand that they didn't have to be under that weight. They would accept their freedom and they would know how much God loves them. You know, I think because these women were loaded down with sin, that to a certain extent, these men were able to play off of the guilt and shame that's already lurking in their hearts because of their issues with sin. I think the Bible describes sin as a slave master. It just keeps like, it entices you, you do it, it condemns you. It entices you, you do it, it condemns you. It tempts you, you give in to it, it condemns you. It makes you feel bad. It's just a perpetual dysfunctional cycle. Because there is guilt, shame, condemnation, low self-esteem going on in the hearts of these women, when you boil it down to the smallest point, like I said earlier, they do not understand how much God loves them. And because of that, these men, as described in verses two through five, are able to come in and take advantage of that. And take advantage of that. It says, let's go back to our uh, verse six. I'm going to read it again. This time we're going to add on another portion. Um, For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives gullible women loaded down with sin, led away by various lust. Good morning, Marjorie. Led away by various lust. Some translations say divers lust. Let's read this. This is a commentary that I found. It says, this gives us some insight into the source of the power which these false teachers acquired over those women of Ephesus who in name were Christians. They had accepted the faith of Christ, but were unable to live life over their passions, to live life over their passions and lust had these no mastery. It says that they were laden with sin and led away with diverse lust. These weak women fell an easy prey to men who procured them by means of their lying doctrines are a false peace. By their words, they seem to have lulled their conscious, the consciousness of their female listeners to sleep. What does that mean? It doesn't mean they literally put them to sleep. It means that the, the, um, the Holy Spirit, the conviction to know right from wrong, they put that to sleep. And so they were, the women were easily deceived um, because they put the they put the conviction of the Holy Spirit to sleep in their hearts. You know, when the Holy Spirit was like, and don't do this or do this or don't do that. Like they put that part of them to sleep. The women began to ignore that and just began to go kind of go along with whatever these teachers were saying. It's that they showed them no doubt how in their school, the false professors, the hypocritical professor school, they might still be Christians, yet indulge their diverse lusts. Okay, hear me out. I know we say we're talking about sexual immorality, and we are, but y'all bear with me. I'm going to repeat this sentence again. They showed them, no doubt, how in their school, they're talking about the school of these hypocritical professors, they might still be Christians, yet indulge in their lust. Does that say something? It showed them you can still be a Christian and, and you can still involve in yourself in sexual immorality. It's totally okay. Good morning, Barbara. Or you can be a Christian and you can still indulge in these, in these lustful things. These hypocritical professors show these women how they might still be Christians, yet indulge in their lust. Remember, our text says that these women were led away by various lust. One commentary said it's not the lust of the flesh, but described it as the insatiable desire to hear teachings 
that satisfy their desired appetite. Meaning that these hypocritical professors were appealing to these women because keep in mind, the women were loaded with sin, the scripture says, they were loaded down with sin. And so they were attracted to the voices and the teachings of these hypocritical professors because it allowed them to, to sit to continue in their sin. They were teaching things that made their sin acceptable. The women were essentially hearing things that justified their sin. Based on what we're seeing today, I agree. I do think that's part of it, as that commentary said. I do also think that lust includes lust of the flesh. It includes pride. It includes attraction to men with power, materialism fueled by power and sexual immorality. Let's go back and let's look at our scripture for those that are just joining us. And so now that we have all of this context, let's reread it. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 for, for y'all that are just joining us. It says, for of this sort are those who creep into households. Actually, let me read it all. I feel like the Holy Spirit said, let's read it all. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to read all of it. Starting at verse one. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so what we're seeing today is what's happening. That people, that there are folks with these characteristics as described in verses two through five that are able to deceive and lead people astray. And the folks that they're leading astray are those that are gullible, those that are loaded with sin, and they're led away by various lust. And specifically, one of the types of lust that I felt like the Lord wanted me to highlight this morning is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, the lust of the flesh, sexual immorality. Leslie, why are we talking about sexual immorality? You have never talked about that before. You know, because it needs to be discussed. It needs to be said. We need to become folks who lean into the truth of God's word in every area. We are living in a culture where sexual immorality is everywhere, y'all. There are so many wrong messages about sex. Premarital sex or promiscuity is portrayed as a sense of empowerment because the devil has lied to people. He is especially women. The lie that he's giving women is that promiscuity gives you control over your body. It says that you are powerful. That is the biggest, that's the biggest lie. That is the biggest ounce of, of, um, of trash that I have heard. Because anyone who knows the heart of their father knows that that is not a sense of empowerment to just let your body, which God has given you, be free with any and everybody. That is not the heart of the father because he values you. And when something is precious, he has a special place for it, not with anyone and anything. You know, it really sounds like I kind of jumped ahead of myself, but it sounds like the way that the enemy deceived Eve in some ways. He tempted her with something that God was protecting her from. Right. Remember, he was like, well, God doesn't want you to eat this apple because he knows that you'll become like him. What? That didn't make any sense. 
And so in the same way, the enemy is lying to women saying that, you know, that, you know, your sense of empowerment, your ability to be able to sleep with whoever, whenever, wherever, however, is a sense of empowerment because, you know, and God is trying to prevent you from, you know, or he's not saying God, but he's saying, and I guess to some people he is, but he's saying in, in society is trying to keep women in a subservient position because they're limiting their sexuality. What? So the enemy tempted Eve with something that God was protecting her from because God loved her enough to want her to not experience the consequences that come with that decision that she made. You know, the enemy has been lying to men too. Men have had their identities fall down to how many people they, they can sleep with. Wrong messaging about sex is highlighted in music, in movies, billboards, commercials, and even cartoons. Why? Why is the enemy trying so hard to devalue a gift that God has given to people? Because friends, the enemy's goal, according to John 10.10, 10, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy any experience or anything in your life that God has set up to be beautiful. One of the biggest lies that the enemy is promoting now is um, put your seatbelts on. I love y'all. I say this with all the love in my heart, but the truth has to come out. So put your seatbelts on. One of the biggest lies that the enemy is promoting now is my body, my choice. I know that it is directly connected to the issue of abortion, but it boils down to this. That's, this is what that statement says. I have the right to do whatever I want to do with my body. Let's set some truth on this. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. We're going to shed a little bit of light on this. And if you can, put your eyes on it. Is it just does something when your eyes and your ears are engaged with the word. Verse 12. Give everybody a chance to get there because I want to make sure everybody, you can look it up on your phone. Um, and if you can, share this message with folks that you know who could be blessed by it. Verse 12. You say, I am allowed to do anything but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. It says you can't say that. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies and God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he's raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scripture says the two are united into one. I'm going to stop there. It says, the scripture says the two are united into one. That is the two are united into one sexually. Friends, it is not God's will for you to be united with 25, 30 people. It is not God's will for you to be united with the person that you saw wherever. It is not God's will for you to be united sexually with whoever you just decide to. That's not the will of God. That is not empowerment. That's not empowerment. Verse 17, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 
Verse 18, run from sexual sin, exclamation mark. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. It is not my body, my choice when you were in Christ. You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Now, I'm not talking to people who do not profess Jesus as their Lord, but I am talking to people who do profess that Jesus is their Lord. The Bible says you do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. We're focusing on 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Yes, you have free will. You do. But in honoring the Lord with your body, free will does not mean engaging in sexual immorality. That's not what that means. God has established sex only in the confines of marriage because he loves us and understands the consequences that can come from such a sacred act when handled improperly. It is highly probable that sex outside the marriage can open up the door of fear shame, and guilt in your life. Fear of the relationship not turning out as you desired. Fear of, you know, fear of contraception not working. And as a result, experiencing diseases and pregnancies that you're not prepared for. Shame could come from exposing your body and giving yourself in the most intimate way to someone who might not value you. You know, that's, they aren't saying that when the music, the movies, and the billboards are promoting sexual immorality. They're not showing you the other side of these things. In Genesis 2.25, it says, they, meaning Adam and Eve, were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were unashamed. There was no shame there. There was no fear there. They were not afraid of, of, of consequences that they were not prepared for. Eve was not ashamed if Adam was going to get up and never return her phone call. They were not ashamed of getting diseases. They were not ashamed of having to dull their conscience so they can keep giving into their lust. They were not ashamed. There was, there was none of that there. It was a safe environment. There was no fear of judgment because they were both equally vulnerable. Adam did not have, was not towering over Eve or didn't feel like he had the advantage over Eve or he got over on her. He was taking advantage of her. They were both equally vulnerable. And friends, that's how the Lord wants it. That's why he wants it in a marriage that is led by him because there is equal vulnerability. The enemy likes to use guilt as a tool. Remember, we talked about sin being a slave master, right? It tempts you to do it and it beats you with shame and guilt and condemnation. And it just keeps you on this perpetual wheel of temptation and, and condemnation. You know, as a result of experiencing sexual immorality, you may experience the guilt of doing something you knew deep down inside you should not have done. The conviction of the Holy Spirit 
that the enemy will, will try to pervert into condemnation, bringing on shame and guilt. That's not even touching on the spiritual component that involved during sex, which is what we read in that scripture earlier. Hear me out. God does not want his children to experience any of these consequences. However, society does not talk about the emotional and the spiritual consequences of having sex outside of marriage. Society is not telling you, like the scripture said, that you're not supposed to sleep with a prostitute. And then if you do, then you'll become one with that prostitute. They're not saying that. They want to boil it down to two things. Society boils it down to two things. And unfortunately, it's all rooted in selfishness. Number one, how to protect your body from disease. How to do what I want to do when I want to do it and prevent myself from getting ill physically. Number two, how to protect your body from unwanted pregnancy. And unfortunately, society claims to have the antidotes for both of these things. It's like you have to take medicine for the medicine when the sickness could have been prevented in the first place. God wants sex for you to be to be not shameful, to not be fear based, but to be beautiful. His ways are not old fashioned, but will always be true, regardless of the culture that we're living in. You know, someone will say, Leslie, this is not 1945. This is not 1955. This is 2022 and things are different. Friends, God's word is true. It doesn't matter whether it's 2022 or whether it's going to be 2032. His word is eternal. His word is the truth. It is no longer living your own truth. These random truths just didn't come out of nowhere. Like God's word is the truth, regardless of the culture we're living in. And it boils down to this. Why does God say these things? Why does he want these things for us? Because he loves us. He loves us. Depending on where we are in Christ, depending on how mature we are, where we are, we may not fully understand why God says certain things because he loves us. You know, I think about um, my daughter is that she's eight and there are certain things like there are certain people I'm like, mm -mm. nope, nope, mm -mm. you can't play with them, you can't. And she doesn't understand what I'm seeing because of my maturity and my experience and my discernment. She's not getting it right now. But because she knows that I love her, you know, at first she's like, ah, mom, I want to do it. I don't understand. But then when I begin to explain to her, she trusts in what I'm telling her. And then later on, she begins to see it. I pray that the Lord opens up her eyes and she begins to see certain things, even at eight. We have to start seeing God's word from a place of love because he loves us. He's not trying to subtract something from us. He's trying to add value. Like he's trying to add something to us. And he wants us to experience everything in this life the way that he intended. He wants us to experience the good life Everything that came from Jesus dying on the cross so that we could experience, God wants us to experience all of that. 1 Peter 2.11. 1 Peter 2.11. It's so interesting. The title of this chapter in, in the Bible says, Living Godly in a Pagan Society. It says, Dear Friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. It, wa it wages war against your soul. These sinful desires are enemies to your soul. It robs you of the best life in that area that God intended. You know, I came across this excerpt from a C.S. Lewis book. C.S. Lewis is the author of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And he wrote this book many years ago called Mere Christianity, which he described our modern battle with human sexuality. And I'm going to read to you an excerpt from his book. I thought it was so eye-opening and so interesting. This is what he says. The Christian idea of marriage is based on Christ's words that a man and wife are to be regarded as a single organism. For that is what the words one flesh would be in modern English. And the Christians believe that when he said this, he was not expressing a sentiment, 
but stating a fact, just as one is stating a fact when one, hold on guys, when one says that a lock and its key are one mechanism or that a violin and a bow are one musical instrument, the inventor of the human machine, God, was telling us that it's two halves, the male and the female, were made to be combined together in pairs, not simply on the sexual level, but totally combined. The monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual, from all the other kind of unions, which, which was intended to go along with it and make up the total union. The Christian attitude does not mean that there is anything wrong about sexual pleasure any more than about the pleasure of eating. It means that you must not isolate that pleasure and try to get it by itself any more than you ought to try to get the pleasures of taste without swallowing and digesting by chewing things and spitting them out again. You can't separate it from everything else that comes along with it. And that's what society is trying to do. And I'll wrap it up with this. This message is not a condemning message at all. We as believers all the time make wrong decisions because we simply just don't know. We just don't know. You know that scripture, people will perish because of lack of knowledge. I pray that today's teaching gives you the wisdom you need to live righteously in this area. And if you have sinned in this, in this area, God has already forgiven you. Know that. Please, by all means, don't beat yourself up. And, you know, that's not what this video was designed to do. So if you have sinned in this area, this is not a beating you over your head. This is not what this is about. But it is important for us as believers to continue to walk in truth and to know the truth. Because the truth sets us free. And we cannot be like those women that we read about and be deceived because we're caught up in our own lust and only want to hear teachings that co-sign with our sin. 1 John 1.9 says this. I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. 1 John 1, 9 says this. And so hear this out. If you're like, Leslie, I am committing sexual sin still. Or I have, and I just never went to God about it. Listen to 1 John 1, 9. It says this. But if we freely admit our sins, when his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. If we freely admit our sins, when his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. God is just to forgive us our sins because of Christ, and he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, God wants to forgive you he doesn't want you to stay in bondage. He doesn't want you to experience a mediocre life in that part of your life. He wants you to experience his best. The enemy wants to condemn you and beat you up for what you did. And Jesus took care of all of that. He's given you the power and the strength to get back up and to keep moving forward. He's given you the freedom to not be held in bondage to sexual sin or sexual immorality. And to define sexual immorality, it's anything outside the confines of the marriage bed. Pornography is a part of that as well. Um, a lot of times people don't know and they don't think that. Um, so my encouragement to you is to get up and keep moving forward in freedom, wisdom, and forgiveness. And then the last thing that I want to say is let's provide this wisdom to our children and others that we have influence over. Our sweet babies are being bombarded by so many wicked messages regarding sexuality. 
And let's not turn a blind eye to what our children are facing, but let's cover them in prayer. Let's cover them with the blood of Jesus. Let's, you know, ask the Lord to give them spirits of discernment and wisdom so that they will cling to him and run away from evil and talk with them, tell them the truth, tell them about the things that they're being exposed to. Block something that investigate what they're being exposed to. Don't just let them look at YouTube videos or TikTok videos or whatever, and you're not knowing the content that's on there. Investigate the cartoons and the movies and the things that they're being exposed to. I do believe that God has amazing plans for this generation. And that is why the enemy is attacking them so viciously. And it's important that they walk in truth and have a heart for wisdom, for the wisdom of God. Think about it like this. If this generation is going to be the next set of leaders in our world, we want leaders who walk in truth and have the heart for the wisdom of God. So just don't see your grandchildren as children. See them as the next leaders that will be guiding our country, our communities, our schools, our world, and impart with them and pray earnestly that they be rooted and established in the truth of God's word because our world will need it. Our world will need it. Amen. Amen. I so enjoyed teaching on this today. Oh, I get so excited. That's how I know. Um, I just get so excited. And it's just such an honor to, um, to just, just partner with the Lord and just say whatever he wants to be said. So I appreciate you joining this morning. Um, we're going to close it out in prayer. Um, but actually, before we close it out, I'm going to give you a moment because we talked about sexual immorality. If there is anything in your heart this morning that you need to confess to the Lord, we're just not going to get you on the live and hop up and you go on about your day. And he's like, oh, I heard that that was good. But you never just sit in it. So I'm going to give you a couple of moments to sit in it. Bring out your journal. Let's talk with the Holy Spirit. Let's see what he's communicating to your heart this morning. Is there something that he's trying to get you free from? Is there something that he's like, man, you can't keep you can't keep watching that because if you watch that, you will fall into sexual sin. Or there are people that he's like, oh, you need to back away from. Like, what's going on in your heart? Are there children that you may need to talk to or guard more carefully? What is the Holy Spirit leading you to do this morning? Please hear me when I say my prayer is for you to be like right in tune with him. Just for me to like lead you to the Holy Spirit and you and him talk it out. So whatever that is, I just want to encourage you to write that down. And I'm going to pray as you're writing down and, you know, you can pray along with me. We'll kind of go from there. Father, in Jesus name. God, we just thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you said that, that the truth will set us free. And so, Lord, we thank you that we are your disciples and that we love your truth. And God, we thank you, Lord, for shining the light and revealing to us things regarding um, sexual immorality, Lord. God, we thank you that you're not helping our consciousness to be numbed because how prevalent it is in our world. But that, Lord, you're having us, God, to be the salt of the earth, to be bright lights, to stand out, to walk righteously, to uphold your word. And we thank you, God, that we are doing it in a way, Lord, that is loving and that is gracious, God. And that, Lord, um, is not condemning, Lord. But God, we thank you, Lord, um, for searching our hearts this morning, God. And if there is anything in our heart, any unconfessed sexual sin um, in our hearts, Lord, we ask, God, um, that you forgive us for it, Lord. God, and we repent, Lord, and we believe that with the confession of our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, I pray, Lord, 
for my brother, our sister, that's struggling with sexual sin today. Lord, and I just thank you for their freedom. God, I thank you that by faith they are taking their freedom this morning. And that, God, you're giving them the wisdom and the strength to walk it out. You know, oftentimes folks pray and they're like, oh, but I still have this thought. And how do I deal with this? Lord, we thank you that you're helping them, that you're literally giving them um, practical ways to walk out your word by renewing their minds, taking captive their thoughts, avoiding what's going on in their eye gate, their ear gate, okay? cutting certain people off in connection with certain people off, Lord. God, I thank you, Lord, that my prayer is that we will not reason um, and try to justify our sin because it's so common in the world, but that we will raise our standard up to your truth. That is my prayer for all of us. My prayer is for our sweet babies, that they will understand the beauty of sexual purity and not fall prey into sexual immorality that you will protect all of our children and show them, Lord, show us how to communicate and teach these things to them so they can understand your heart for them in this area. Help them to cling to what is good and to run away from what is evil. And Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise. And God, we just, God, we just ask, Lord, that you do a revolutionary work in the music that's being pumped out, the movies that's being pumped out, the celebrities that are having microphones, the things and the people that are not of you, God, we are asking you that you completely turn the volume down on them and you make their voices mute. And that, God, you raise up the voices and elevate your people who are speaking truth, God, and let truth be spoken over our schools, over our nations, over this country. Let truth be spoken, Lord, in every neighborhood, every community center, every playground. Turn the volume on those that are not lining up with you, Lord. Turn down their volume. Turn the volume down. Make them mute, Father, and elevate the voices of your people who are declaring your truth in your word. Father, we all come together and we believe that there is nothing too hard for you. Father God, We don't. it doesn't matter how prevalent it is. Nothing is too hard for you, Lord. We give you the glory, honor, and the praise for giving us the boldness God, that if you're asking us to say something, that we will say it exactly how you want us to say it with all the love and grace and truth that you are giving us to say it. And the wisdom, if you're asking us to take action in an area, we thank you that we will do so boldly. God, that we are all part of your body and we all play a role to see your, your mission in this earth. Lord, you love your people. And you want as many people to come into the kingdom as possible. Everybody, Lord. You want everyone. And we have the ability to reach people. And we thank you that you use us in ways, God, that are just however you choose to use us. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you all for joining this morning. I am so excited. I'm so excited this week also because I'll be recording um, my first podcast interview uh, with a sweet woman um, from an organization called Pro Grace out of Chicago. And I'll be giving a little bit more details around that, but I'm so excited. I just thank you for joining this morning. And I believe that we are a lot, we are stronger. We're a little bit stronger than we first got on. And anyway, I love you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful Saturday. Enjoy your weekend. Oh, Memorial Day. Enjoy your Memorial Day. Um, and a sweet blessing to all those sweet teachers. School is out, I believe. We're getting out. So bless you. I know my friend Barbara's a teacher. Bless you, Barbara. Um, and anyone else who's a teacher that may be listening, God bless you. The Lord needs you and you're doing a wonderful and amazing thing. So anyway, bye guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.